daytime with Aston Avery. Stephen Smith's with me. Joining us yeah. right now is uh, known as the PR guru, having put uh, someone like Vivian Westwood in a, in a canary cage, a vice thought by the likes of Julian Assange there. Guest Richard Hillgrove, PR guru, yeah. joins us. Hello, Richard. Lovely to be here. L great to Hi, have Richard. you. Looking forward to this. Did you like the Ab Fab opening we had for you? Amazing. Wheels on fire. <laughs> we need, some, need some music as well, but anyway. <laughs> yes, it was Abfab. I remember that now. It was the yeah, Jennifer Saunders Dragon Omni show. The, the female PR guru, uh, Tina. <laughs> so, yeah. yes. so, uh, so, uh, female, Ri yeah, sure. so, Richard, we're going to be discussing, obviously, we're discussing about men's mental health here. But first, what is a PR and how did you become a PR yourself? Well, I started out, it's quite rare actually, because most PRs come from the world of journalism, but I came from a commercial side. So I was at Express Newspapers, I was the advertisement controller for, for regions and international for Richard Desmond when he used to own OK Magazine. And I was across Daily Express, Daily Star, OK Magazine. And because I handled all this business for, for Desmond across the lot, I started getting roped into these meetings and they used to say, you know, well, could you go and see the editor of this and do a favour for this client? And in 2004, I jumped ship. Um, my wife at the time, I still live with her, we're divorced but live together, Lois Perry. Um, she was an okay girl. Uh, she encouraged me to, to jump ship and launch my own business. She said, you didn't come to the UK from New Zealand just to sit working for someone else. You need to sort of launch your own business. And I launched a PR company, not having a clue what PR actually was at the time, but I've learned in the last 20 years, I've sort of worked it out. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. Well, you've you worked with some incredible, with some incredible people. Vivian Westwood, rest in peace. She's a wonderful lady. I was lucky enough to meet. What would she actually like, and uh, what was it like looking after someone like that? Yeah, she was brilliant. I, we did the. Um, she had a sort of like split, not split personalities. Probably not the right phrase, but um, she had the fashion side, and then she had this activism side. And because um, I'm not, I haven't got much fashion sense myself. I did all the the activism side so all the you know human human rights Julian Assange protesting um climate Armageddon you know the world is ending all that side of stuff was really important to her and I would activate the media with some incredible stunts that would would sort of create a total viral traction so we're at sort of I was locked over on the activism side leaving all of her internal PR people to handle all the sort of you know, model size dresses and stuff like that. So um, that was what I did. But it was about seven years working with Dame Vivian West, which is a great lady, you know, really. I, I, I have to ask you, did she ever dress you? Um, not me personally. I don't think I could fit into any of the clothing. And, and I've never tr tried any of the women's clothing. Andreas obviously has a fantastic men's range. At yeah. one point, I think I was thin enough to put just a men's, <laughs> a men's shirt. And they don't seem to do oversized. <laughs> <laughs> could you give us a because uh, she was so important Vivian West could you give a little example of one of the things you did for her uh, I mean, you, you, made, you touched on the cage oh the cage the cage was one of the last things I did with her that was Julian Assange it was like a, um, a fetish cage and she was dangling canary in a cage outside the Old Bailey I'd come up with a stunt it was on 9-11 um, 2015 actually that's still used as a sort of one of your greatest hits if you like yeah. Uh, from meeting the Queen without knickers, um, that wasn't me. But I got her to go in a white tank to the f then Prime Minister's personal residence in Oxfordshire um, to make a chemical attack on his family. Um, and we had just like a lineup of media, must have been about 60 different media, all up this Oxford rural street outside David Cameron's house with her in the, you know, the, the tank cockpit making this chemical attack on his family. We had low flying helicopter, we had an armed guard with a machine gun at his front door. <laughs> All for real, you know what I mean? It's like, was she arrested? Wow. Was she arrested? No, she wasn't arrested because we weren't actually breaking the law. We're up on Normal Street. The tank had an actual reg number on it. And so we were as close to cross breaking the law as you could get, but we didn't actually do anything particularly wrong. I mean, they, they stopped us entering um, the Prime Minister's property, of course. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit boring, isn't it? But <laughs> and I, and I, actually, on the 40th anniversary of Punk, the Six Pistols, Anik in the UK, she was there and we did a five million pound punk burn. I organised all that as well. I mean, like a multitude of things over the years. 
exciting. It must, must be really amazing doing yeah, that. It and obviously, uh, you have children yourself here, uh, there, Richard. Obviously, we're discussing about mental health here. Do you teach them about looking after their own mental health, your own children here? Well, I certainly do because I'm attuned to that. And my son, he works for our PR agency now. He's 19 years of age, coming up 20. And when he shows any signs of potentially like um, mood swings, I sort of think, you know, I know it's genetic. And my father had bipolar. I've been diagnosed with it. My father took his own life. Um, he ended up throwing himself off a bridge. And obviously I've had that as a sort of haunting echo. When my son says anything that even is, I have to be careful not being too extreme with him, but um, I'm, I'm well aware that you need to talk about these things, get them out in the open and, and do the right things to try and create a level playing field in your head rather than have a situation where you're sort of up and down, up and down. But my son, yeah, for sure, I'm always very aware of that. I think you have to, you just touched on something that some listeners won't know about. What is bipolar? Would you explain to the uh, listeners? Well, it's another phrase for manic depression, isn't it? I mean, I think manic depression says it all. I mean, it's becoming, a, unfortunately, it's becoming a bit trendy for everyone to be bipolar now. So all these celebrities are saying they are. You know, but I've actually I got a diagnosis when I was on 52 now, but I think I was about 19 when I got diagnosed with it and prescribed all these drugs to take from lithium and all that. I mean, the first thing I was prescribed was stelazine, which I think almost made me froth at the mouth. And, you know, but I decided in the end not, not to not to take the medication. But bipolar is obviously when you have extreme highs um, and then you have extreme lows. Um, Kanye West is a perfect example of someone who, in the media who, who has bipolar. So you mentioned that you don't take medication for it. Um, there are lots of people out there that will be listening right now. What do you do for it to, to control it and make your life uh, easier? Well, I think you've got to obviously get into a personal state of awareness. I've had, over the years, I've had certain amounts of talking therapy without going completely down the rabbit hole with that. But being very active as well. You know, I'm not necessarily an athletic um, person per se, but making sure I stay physically active. So I go to like a military style boot camp. And if you start getting pent up, almost frustrated emotions, which seems to be affecting your balance, blasting it out through physical exercise, you know, at least twice a week, really does sort of keep you in a sort of place where you feel a sense of personal control because it's that whole sense of losing control or, you know, either getting too high and starting to do reckless things or getting so low you feel like the world's at an end and that physical that physical side of things is really important to keep flowing basically and and, and not to lose yourself yeah absolutely that's that that's that good you know uh, do you feel so men to this day and age are under pressure to uh, to conform to or, or, or the traditional men are under threat I think there is, but I think everyone's feeling a bit under threat. For whatever reason, there seems to be these extremely disruptive narratives. So women are feeling like lost um, and they're now questioning what is it to be a woman? Um, and men, obviously, from the hashtag Me Too era, are starting to feel like their impulse to, to even ask a woman on the date is almost like a sexual assault. And and so, so you know, yeah, that's overstating it somewhat, but I mean, how yeah, do men be men in the traditional sense? That's now vilified. But then women are feeling attacked as well. And I think they, a lot of people are feeling attacks because there seems to be this narrative play where everyone seems to be wrong at what they do now. Yeah, I think also that there's people making themselves famous by coming out and be, trying to be pinned. People like Rose Posey Parker, who's fri frightening people, saying that these trans women are running into the ladies' toilets and raping them when there's no evidence whatsoever about this. And if she's talking about transvestites, which are completely different than someone that, that uh, are, are trans. Uh, and she's growing and growing and, and getting an audience of people that now think they're under threat from the trans community. When they're not, uh, there's more no, people true. being raped by the Metropolitan Police officers than there has ever been, been the trans. Well, we don't see Posey Parker uh, out there uh, protesting against the Metropolitan Police. Uh, it's all quite frightening. And I think there's a lot of these people that have come along uh, uh, want a voice and, and are starting to scare people. No, no, I agree. And fear narratives are so much easier to spread than, than the other way around. I mean, I, we go to church every week 
Um, I was actually raised a Roman Catholic, but um, I, my um, ex-wife, wife, who I live with, raising our children, um, is in the Church of England. We go every week, and everyone's still really frightened of the COVID stuff. So everyone's like, rather than a sign of peace, shaking hands physically, everyone's still waving so they don't get near each other. And um, it, it's that, that thing that was brought in, and people are so frightened, whether it's viruses or, or whether to be saying something which is sort of a sign of white supremacy and and and, and privilege and, and it just goes on and on and on. I think there's probably 70 different narratives that are all sort of like firing on all cylinders, basically immobilizing everyone from even functioning now. Yeah, you know, they're, 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 again, uh, the ch uh, religion's like a gun. In the right hands is a great thing. And the wrong hands, uh, as we've seen, you know, we've got the huge thing in the United States at the moment against uh, uh, drag queens uh, doing, you know, we, we, we grew up with panto dames uh, and drag queens reading you know, stories to children. You know, as far as I've seen, there's never any evidence of a drag queen ever assaulting a child, but there are lots of evidence for uh, religious uh, fanatics assaulting children and gunning children down. Uh, I mean, it's just also double standards sad. at the moment. It's quite yeah, frightening. Yeah, yeah. It's frightening. Yeah. It is frightening and uh, and sad to hear as well. But obviously, coming into what we're discussing here there, uh, Richard, as well, obviously in the film industry, would you likely to see a gender-neutral James Bond down the line? No. <laughs> I quite, I, I'm a bit of a traditionalist in the sense I don't really want to see a gender-neutral. I don't. I mean, I didn't really want to see a, a, a black Anne Boleyn either. Um, I just, just think that, some things are quite nice to have in zones. And I think young people are sort of grabbing hold of 80s popular culture and almost fetishizing it now because they desperately want some of those old values. I think things like Peaky Blinders with traditional male role models of men being quite strong. I love and that show. Yeah. But these Brilliant things are show. all historical and they're all, all becoming sort of almost fetishized by people because they're so desperate to not have, have everything wash away in some multicultural soup of diversity. And I don't want to sound like I'm not open and I am very open but um, I think I think all of the sort of everything goes thing and let's erode our past and all that is not a good thing particularly. Yeah I, I agree with you. It's, it's kind of where the, the, the problem is going to arise. I like my James Bond as the book was written about a Cambridge uh, 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 who skied and I probably was a spy and and Sean Connery played it and even funny enough uh, uh, Ian Fleming didn't like Sean Connery he didn't want to be what he thought I think <laughs> not um, at first it, it, not it, at it, first he didn't like him every time. <laughs> he didn't want uh, uh, that I think that's where the problem is if you start threatening someone's traditional uh, role as a, there we have a heterosexual man that sleeps with women and dashes around and goes, no, 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 something has to be gay or a woman or whatever. That's when you're going to, the problems arise, leave that alone. Yes, of course you need uh, uh, to, to move on and give, give LGBT all the rights to, and this uh, all the rights, but don't uh -huh. then start threatening a, a, a heterosexual section because then when they, the mum and dad and two point kids start getting threatened, then there's going to be problems. Correct. I have to agree with you on that, yeah. 100%. And obviously, for the rest of the year, what have you got planned for the rest of the year, Richard? Well, um, work seems to be getting really busy. Um, there seems to be a lot of action in this whole Metaverse Web 3.0 space. We've been doing, um, we did some work with uh, the people in Los Angeles who produced the Sir Anthony Hopkins NFT Orange Comet. And I've been doing quite a few talks to the metaverse next week, for instance, I, I developed something called the Sir David Amos Children's Parliament with Sir David Amos. He was the MP that yeah, got killed. Was, tragically. But next week, and it was a virtual children's parliament, but next week I'm taking 30 of the kids into the APPG metaverse and web 3.0 in the House of Lords. And it seems to be quite pivotal, this whole sort of space, because you've got this whole threat of CBDC, all the world governments are trying to make us go towards digital currency. And the frightening thing is that once you get tracked to that degree, they'll tell you when you can buy meat, what you can buy, um, and, and you've had enough of that. And that kind of is the threat of this whole digital ID. And our freedoms have been eroded a bit. And, you know, and me, having represented Julian Assange in the past, you know, I'm really stand up for freedoms. Yes. And I kind of find it quite innocent innocent what the kids are doing and the fact that they're waltzing into this metaverse virtual reality and 
we need to make sure our freedoms are protected in that. And the more and more I talk about it, the more interesting conversations I'm having, and we seem to be getting sort of engaged in more and more NFT projects, things I was never involved with, but it seems to be a real up curb at the moment. And it seems I think you just have to clarify for our audience what NFT is, please. Non, you go. Non-fungible token, which just basically means like a JPEG that you pay money for that floats on the internet. Oh, cool. I mean, people, cool. I get mad cool. situations where people will buy a group of pixels and spend ten million dollars buying it. I mean, it's insane, but yeah. um, it sounds exciting. <laughs> I mean, Sotheby's well, created a metaverse division the other day to trade in NFTs, so um, you can see that everyone's clambering towards this new gold rush, or is it just a mirage? Is there, just, so, so, oh, no, we haven't time. is there a difference between Sotheby's online and Sotheby Auction House? Well, uh, Sotheby's Metaverse was probably created before the FTX crash. Um, but Sotheby's website is obviously one thing, but the Metaverse is a division for the trade in, in terms of a virtual reality space. The things that people trade inside the Metaverse are NFTs. But it's a lot of smoke and mirrors at the moment. A lot of people are just talking up a lot. Yeah, of yeah, I find that, yeah. And the actual delivery is still a little way off, but not a huge way off. And then you've got the artificial intelligence threat. You've got people like Elon Musk saying, you know, they, artificial intelligence may destroy us all. And it's becoming yet another fear narrative, ironically. Um, but... I'm quite interested in riding that bucking bronco and seeing what happens. And that seems to be where this year is shaping up. Not only doing that, but it's a massive area. Well, Richard, it's been amazing having you. We'd love to have you back on again to talk about NFT later on yes. and a few yeah, months' yeah. time when we do a special on it. Uh, thanks, but thank, thank you ever so much. And thanks thank for coming you. on. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank Before you, you go, Richard, Richard, how can the listeners find out more? Oh, yeah. uh, www.sixhillgrovepr.com. And it's the numeral six. Uh, great to have you on richard thank you bye 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 richard hillgrove here on gateway 